All right, here's a fun thing that we can kind of get set up. <clears throat> We've got the 100 Years West anime rolling underway. Um, I'm, there's going to be some crazy stuff for the people that are anime only that haven't touched uh, the manga and don't know what the 100 Years Quest is. They only know it from when Guild Arts tried to go on it and failed when he ran into Acnologia. And there are reasons for that. There's very clear store reasons that people will find out within the first episode of 100 Years Quest. So either if there's anybody that is a manga reader that just wants to get a refresher, or if there are people that are anime only, I mean, maybe there'll be some of you that show up after chapter, or, sorry, I guess episode one, and want an understanding exactly of what they're going to be working with when it comes to the 100 Years Quest itself. Because the 100 Years Quest, for, again, those who are anime only, it's not really like an arc the same way a lot of events are. It's more like a saga where all of these arcs are connected, they're their own thing, but they are part of an overall story setup. I mean, really, when you look at it, similar to how Mishima usually kind of does this thing, it's just more straightforward and saying, like, this is all part of the 100 Years Quest. I mean, you can look at all the arcs leading up to Sirius Island. That's one kind of umbrella set of arcs for the most part. There's some stuff, obviously, that branches over to Alvarez and whatnot, blah, 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 but, but you know what I mean. So I won't go too much into spoilers. I'm going to give generally a brief description of each of the dragon gods and give a little bit of information. There will be some spoilers. Obviously, we're going to go to their designs. Um, I'm going to be only talking about their dragon designs because that's their actual bodies. That's what they actually look like naturally. Their humanoid forms and what shape they decide to take when they go talk to humans in, in you know that smaller state. That's entirely up to their own wishes and what they want to be looking like when they go to confront them or just go around a general conversation so uh, i'm more so going to be going over how they actually look because it has to do with their specific species of type of dragon that they are what subtype of dragon and what exactly about their design tells us about you know their their character you know because like i said they their their dragon form is who they actually are appearance wise uh, and how they look by themselves, and their humanoid form is how they decide to look whenever they go into this state. So, like I said, brief spoilers. I'm going to kind of just give a... What would be like if you clicked on the character and it gave you like a, par you know, like a paragraph or so of just a description, um, and nothing that I'm going to say is going to be like, oh yeah, this is how this, this, this one is defeated, or this happens here, this decides to go completely, you know, plot twist here, you know, there's there's some that you won't expect and there's there's some that you won't expect i guess in good and bad ways i mean really only one but we won't talk about that and then there's some that are going super hype ways and then i mean obviously right now in the manga we've got one of them just getting ready to, to warm up and go crazy so without further ado we'll just kind of start talking to him the first one is going to be the easiest one just because he's the first one that we get to know and that is Merkphobia, the water dragon god this picture over a little bit more He's, he's really interesting just from a standpoint of his size is really big. And he's not the biggest dragon, obviously. But in terms of comparison to normal dragons, he's still large. With uh, wood dragons, they are known to be large. With the water dragons, as far as we know, Merkphobia is just big. Because really, when you look at the comparison later, and we'll talk about that a little bit, a certain one guy that he's going to run into in Season 1, he is just large. And it's not just that he's serpent-like, it's also just his girth. He's a just a bulky dragon. I really I guess, like, even in terms of bulk, he's not the bulkiest, but if you, like, you know, compare them next to each other, he's going to be one of, like, probably the second biggest in terms of just general size. Now, Merc is a reform dragon, and that's something I'm going to talk about too. I won't, like I said, I won't give detailed spoilers, but I will talk a little bit about where these dragons are from an alignment standpoint and where they sit in the series as of, you know, their own personal choices. And don't be assumed that he just, you know, Merc was always good. Um, you'll find out a little bit more, like I said, if you decide to, to wait throughout Season 1 or just get, like, like I said, a short TLDR here. 
but Merkphobia was a dragon that was anti-human for a long time. He would kill and eat humans on the regular. It didn't matter to him. And then eventually he ended up finding a human that he ended up getting along with. He decided to save her, and then just after bonding with her, he kind of saw that he was being a bit of a jerk, and, you know, maybe murdering innocent people and eating them was not the coolest thing to do. And since then, he's just decided to work towards bettering his himself and, you know, doing more for the people around him. He is a reformed dragon. He just kind of wants to have a happy and healthy setup to where he's at. And the people around him that worship him, he doesn't even want that to happen. He kind of just wants to chill with them and just go about his daily activities and chill. I mean, he's, he's just relaxing. He's like of the calm tides of other dragons. You know, As the ocean is, it can be raging and crazy, or it can just be calm and, and still and, and just relaxing to be around. So Merc, Merc is definitely the easiest one. Um, I will say even the one that has a much shorter amount of time on screen than him um, is, is more hard to understand, but part of that is just because we didn't have as much from him, whereas Merc, we get a good amount. We have a good amount to kind of just understand where he's coming from, what he's, you know, got going on, and where exactly he's trying to direct himself. I mean, he is a dragon of the water. All forms of water are his. That includes ice. We've seen how it happens. Like, he's completely manipulated other people's magic that either water or ice, he's able to take control and command over it. It's all within the confines of his abilities and his dominion over the element itself. He is the peak of all water dragons and the peak of water manipulators within the fairy tale world. As far as we know, there has never been anyone above him in this attribute, and there never will be. So, next up, probably one... He, I mean, it's like, yeah, one of my favorites, but it's like there's only so many of them, so it's not like there's, a, you know, dozens to choose from. But uh, the one that builds the most just general startup hype other than the one at the very top, but we have, as I was talking about, like Merkphobia was big in comparison to other dragons. We have big comparison to all dragons. We have Alderaan, the wood dragon god, and as far as we know, the biggest dragon to ever exist within the fairy tale world. Now, he is absolutely massive. He has hands on each, or sorry, hands on each city. He's got cities on each hand. He's got one on each shoulder, one on the back of his neck, and so much open space that he could, like, he's literally about the size of a country. He is absolutely humongous, but on top of it, he's like that in size, but his girth like really if you if you took him and you hollowed him out or like maybe just kind of like had people live inside almost like a kind of like think of like how ant hills are designed he would be like a, a moving continent because he'd be able to house probably billions of people all over his body and on top of that like the giant tree on his back isn't even really touched or uh you know utilized in any of that mass and so he's got absolutely size on on max for the verse and then his whole setup he is pretty straightforward in how he looks he's, he's really just this big bulking mass of, of gnarled roots and vines all contorted together to create this giant just behemoth of weight and size and he's got like a, just this big massive tree growing out of his back that you know is like one of the you know clear signs he is as a wood dragon what's funny is like people talk about like well how would Akin Loki not know about him he's so big but you have to also consider how big the fairy tale world is and on top of that he's going to be really just seeing stuff through smell I kind of hope they bring that up in the anime because to me at least I think the way that you would just be around like you, like say if you had like oh yeah because of all the the tourism and stuff around the general area it smells more like food and doesn't give off that dragon smell or if it's because he's a tree you know based being you know with all those different wood and whatnot you say oh yeah he's able to, to have all these different plants and, and trees and, and scents going off him to hide his smell because that's the main way that actually you'd be able to locate somebody like him is through their sense of smell and again he's big but it's not like you just fly up in the air and you're like, oh, I see him over there. It's like, no, the, the fairy tale planet is gigantic. So even though he's this big, you can't fully 
you can't just assume he's going to be able just to go around there and just be like, oh, yeah, I looked over there. And, like, Akinologia also seemed to like the slow hunt. He seemed to kind of want to walk in his humanoid form, as we saw at the end of Dragon Cry. So I would assume that he likes to take the almost like Elden Ring style looking for random caverns and dungeons approach to it. He just likes to look around and then eventually find one of them. And Alderaan, this isn't going to be like a main story spoiler, is we actually have a bit of Alderaan's lore, which I personally find one of the most interesting things about all the dragon gods, is 300 years prior to events, he ended up fighting Acnologia, getting hurt, and then having to go recuperate. And that was 100 or so years after Acnologia started. So... At some point, Alderaan either was waiting for him to be found or was hiding and then decided, well, I'm just going to try and fight him. Got completely destroyed, but managed to make it out of there alive and get to where he could set up to get of this size and just sit and gather power and mass and just grow continuously over 300 years to where he could be at the level of Akinologia. And I'm, I'll talk about a little bit of that at the end, just the statements of you know them being on par with Akinologia once we kind of get through it. But Alderaan is a very traditional dragon. He does not like humans. He sees them as pretty much cattle. He doesn't really care about their feelings, regardless of whether or not they hate him or love him. He, they are just food to him, and there's no reason for him to consider them as anything else. Um, Alderaan is a very old, mentally set dragon. Personally, if I had to guess out of them, I still think he's the oldest. Just because if he was already big for a wood dragon when he, he you know, tried to fight Akinologia 300 years prior, I would imagine he's already hundreds and hundreds of years old, even going into that standpoint, and then another 300 years. Because the way that he even grew this big was not naturally said of like him just going about his daily life like he he set something up to where he could benefit it you know at, at a maximum degree to get to this stage so you have this very old man style dragon he's just pissed off at anything with humans he doesn't really care about their feelings he just wants to get back to to treating them like nothing and going about his day so for him, you just have this absolute behemoth of, of power and tradition. Um, talking about his abilities, Alderaan is really neat because he he has like the general wood dragon abilities that you would expect, you know, manipulation of trees and wood. But the parts of him that I think are really cool because of his perk of, I guess, the wood dragon nature is that he can spawn these essentially characters, but they're like... Again, it's it's hard to kind of like go full into it, but I don't want to spoil everything for you guys. But he, he can make these essentially other characters, but they're not really other characters. They are extensions of him. So all their abilities in reality are his abilities. They're just almost manifested through like a herald. Think of if like you had somebody like, Gal I'm going to say like Galactus, and then it's going to be like there's people who don't know about too much about Galactus. You know, just any character that has, like, set, like, little minions that ride out for them. But instead of it being like, oh, yeah, I found this guy. It's like, yeah, I birthed this dude from my chest. He just kind of, like, came to be uh, almost kind of like Aizen and some of the Espada and some of the Arankar. I guess none of the Espada, because only the ones that we saw in Wonder Watch. It, 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 this isn't a Bleach video. Um, but he has all of these neat little perks that he can pretty much utilize at any point. And any time that they are defeated he, they're like set on a timer to where they will respawn because as long as the actual alderaan is still alive you can't permanently kill any of his minions they will just come back so alderaan himself is probably one of the most more deadly to fight because he's just he's got the all package you know size to, to even deal with he's got hacks and scary just general ways in reality, if he didn't have, like, these crazy people that were, uh, you know, dedicated to him, you might have a lot of just general numbers of, of randoms thrown at you. But Alderaan himself, like I said, he's, he's in the upper half of the, of the Dragon Gods, in my opinion. Uh, I really like him. Um, it's, it's funny because he's a character that 
you know, if you watch this video and then you wait for, you know, probably season two of 100 Years Quest when we get to him, he's going to be a character that is a very good example of Mishima doing a lot of show, don't tell, and then let you figure out aspects about him in order to understand where he's at. But next up, we have one of the other ones, like I, I said, that, that does a lot of cheats. There's like a, a very clear defining line for each of the dragon gods and stuff that they do. You either have ones that seem to just be very talented for a dragon and have like lots of upcoming skill like Merc. Um, you have somebody like Alderaan who found a way around where he was at to pretty much cheat his way to become much more powerful. Um, this next one, like an image way over here. Uh, Dogramag, he is kind of in the middle because we don't really know where he was at strength-wise. Um, he... And I don't want to. I don't want to go too much into it, like I said, because his is a little bit interesting. But he's got almost like a way to cheat, but it's it's more like something in addition. Because one thing you'll see is like in the humanoid form that they take versus their dragon form, their humanoid forms aren't as powerful because they're not going to be able to utilize their full strength in their humanoid form versus in their actual dragon stature. Whereas through what Dogermag did is he, he essentially created like, a, you know, used his manipulation of Earth as the Earth Dragon God to set up a massive labyrinth. And then throughout the labyrinth, he has all of these cores that are stored. And as long as these are up, it's storing like a almost level of invincibility for him. It seems to be more done in stages where it's like destroying one doesn't just like, you know, lower him a little bit in strength. It seems to be like... Oh, every time you take out so many, I think there were 72 off the top of my head. So, you know, it's, it's like, oh, well, every every nine or every eight, he drops this, uh, a chunk in power in his humanoid form. Because that's to me, seemed to be what his thing was. Like, obviously, he was, seemed to be invincible while it was up. He just had, like, an invincibility cheat as long as this was present. And while it was present, he was more powerful in his humanoid form than other dragon gods. So it's like, oh, well... If you look at it, maybe it's he, though seemed invincible, it's more so that he, through this level of augmentation, was able to utilize his full power in a smaller form. And that's why he liked to fight in that smaller form, and maybe it was more fun for him. Because he's, he's interesting because he's almost in between the, the sides of either being anti-human or pro-human. He seems like he eats humans and he you know he kills them without much of a problem but he doesn't seem to do it maliciously like out of anger he seems to kind of just do it when he feels like it and then the rest of the time it's more about sport and he just wants to kind of brawl and have like a good time but he's not like zero where zero is like a maniac dober mag seemed more like he was just having fun like he's just there to, to hang out like he's a dude at a barbecue pretty much like he just wants to have a fun time with anybody that was present Dogramag is interesting because he seems to be almost like a new generation of dragon that has gotten more used to a post-human setup world. Uh, we don't really know the age of a lot of them, but I would guess that he's grew up in an act. Oh. My dogs are being a little too crazy right now. Um, but he seems to have grown up in a post acnologi affected world with dragons being not as prominent. And because of that, I think that he has this mentality where he's in a, a dragon position of power, but he doesn't have as much of that dragon dominance kind of mindset. Or he's more of just, yeah, I'm stronger than pretty much everybody else. There's only a couple people that are a contender for me. And because of that, I can kind of just do whatever I want. And he even, you know, as we've seen, has, you know, like I said, I'm not going too crazy. I mean, we'll see the guy I'm talking about in a minute. But he does have a identified friend, which is very strange for a dragon who is not somebody who takes liking to humans and doesn't seem to be in a good shape with any other dragons. The only dragons that have seen to have a connection with each other have all been the post-human dragons because I would imagine just by interacting with humans, you know, creatures that are way more fragile than you, 
that you can kill at any point and you just decide to actually converse with them and get to know them they're going to have much more of a kind general nature to them to where they can be bonded to each other whereas the other dragons who are anti-human generally seem to be more on the strong eat the weak kind of mentality and more of a power struggle dragon lifestyle but dogermag is more so set in the manipulation of earth he doesn't have any kind of like crazy trick moves the same way that alderaan has but it seems more of like he just has more general planning he has more of like how he sets up like an unfair way for somebody to fight him considering if you don't go as a unit see like if you went to go try and fight him yourself you're probably not going to have a good time with all these cores that seem to make him pseudo invincible um Dogger Meg is really cool uh i've always really liked him I, he's one of the people in the anime i'm hoping we get like a little bit of additional content for just because we didn't get any of that flashback material but we have a lot of nice little tells for him and next up we have the dragon who's more of like an enigma that uh, again we won't i won't go too much into spoilers but we have the dragon god of gold we have viernes who has the most interesting design of all of them he is like this dragon with a spanish name he has like a christian halo but he's an egyptian looking dragon made of gold very odd like in terms of combinational design setup but i like his design he's a dragon that's interesting because instead of the way that the previous dragons who set up oh yeah this isn't going to be my strategy in order for my survival and and uh you know climb and power like you have alderaan he's like oh i'm gonna almost kind of hibernate and slowly stockpile power dogerman is like i'm gonna hide these things that that augment me and you know grant me a level of super durability to apparently a point of invincibility all throughout this labyrinth that people are going to be lost in it's massive and it's going to be almost pretty much an impossible task to do while fighting me and then you have viernes who used alchemy actually you know uh, you know shout out to the alchemy in the verse to give up his physical body and become a living idea where he put himself in a building and decides to control everything going within it and he's 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 like the idea of like a uh, sentient factory and he's able just to completely create and do anything within it and manipulate what goes on around it and because of that he's he's like the most enigma i guess really yeah out of it he he has like very little known about him we didn't get a whole lot in depth with him i'm again i'm hoping that we get a little bit more from the anime maybe we just get like a flashback or two uh find out why exactly he's like this i had my hopes that he was going to be more mentally scarred and afraid and that's why he just went all in of getting away from a physical body in the hopes that akinologi would never be able to find him um i i really like the gold aspect of him i just like seeing mishima draw the whole gold medal in his art style um i don't understand how like it's funny enough the officials keep calling him the metal dragon god when he is the gold dragon god is he like he's named after the gold luminary day and his name on that same day is like his name means friday which is the gold luminary day on top of that so it's like how do they keep calling him a metal dragon god when he's specifically gold every time and he does stuff with gold i i don't know either way he's he's one of contention and controversy for obvious reasons but he's one that regardless i like his design and i like the way that I like the way that everything ends with him because it sets up the biggest boy. It sets up the, the big fella that we'll talk about in a minute. So, he's just going to be pretty brief in comparison. I mean, he does a lot of alchemy stuff, you know, mostly science, you know, not doing as much with magic. And, you know, that's going to be that. We didn't find out a lot about him. I mean, he's anti human, but to, to what way and degree is unknown. Now, out of them, you know, for the most part, I did them in, in kind of like order ish. But I saved the best two for last. I saved the best two by far for last. Now, the first one we're going to be seeing is the Moon Dragon God Selene. I don't know, goddess, but they call her god. It's just more of a title thing rather than like and trying to be more precise. 
But design-wise, oof, I love Celine's design. I love that she is a nine-tailed fox dragon. She looks absolutely beautiful. The paneling and scenes with her are glorious. And just her personality. Celine is, again, is interesting because she's not really anti-human. She seems, you know, as we'll know, and I'll, I'll get some stuff for her. She's, she's pro-human, but she is ultimately pro Celine. Because the reason that she likes humans is they're fun. They're just enjoyable to be around. They do things that entertain her. And she is, at the end of the day, out for her own enjoyment. She wants to just have a good time and have time pass while doing, you know, whatever her plans end up, you know, you know, hint, hint, on being where she's going to end up on top. Celine is a absolute monster, badass, fun character. She's going to be the ones that I know once she gets animated is going to be a fan favorite immediately. She just has everything really going for her. The only one that you really can put above her is, is the one for obvious, more so story reasons that I will go into. And like I said, I won't go too much into exactly why the big guy's in all actuality where he's at. I mean, I'll have to give a little bit but not too much i guess i'll have to give like part of it but not give like the in-depth reason as to why it is but anyway selene is funny because where the other dragon gods have for the most part waves where they said okay well i'm powerful but how can i become more powerful selene is more so like merc where merc phobia just seemed to be very naturally talented and powerful even for his race Celine seems to be the same way, where Celine wasn't, oh yeah, let me go obtain this thing or do this way to get more powerful. She just seemed to be naturally this strong and growing. And because of that, Celine doesn't have any backpedal things where she has to kind of be a little bit more sharp or, or kind of weary of it. She just goes about her day and doing fun stuff and doesn't seem to be too worried when it comes to it. I, I really wish that she was present with Actologia. I would have loved to see an interaction between the two of them, maybe one day in a flashback. But that's just kind of going to depend on what exactly they want to add to the anime, unless it ends up happening in the manga. Who knows? Celine is also more of a pure dragon, into where she doesn't seem to do anything too wild outside of the racial ability she has as a dragon it doesn't seem like like for instance you know you had uh doger mag set up all this stuff as i mentioned with these cores in order to augment himself um and you don't have anything outside of you know where she's just gonna just be out like i said with viernes he has alchemy Celine just seems to be a pure moon dragon and how exactly does that work well she just seems to gain power and, and presence of the moon. She can literally just pull the moon around with her. And, you know, she goes in her dragon form. The moon is just out and about, uh, even in the middle of the day. She's able to just be able to drag it around with her. She can do stuff that resembles a moon when it comes to her attacks, but she just outright has shown that she can just make the moon, you know, appear and move to her whim. And on top of that, just like in her, um, you know, in her, in her weaker state, she can just get mad and affect the moon to enlarge it to be multiple times the size of earth uh and just be an absolute scare so Celine is is just a presence of power that is unchecked and i think that's one of the reasons why she's so fun is unlike the other dragon gods she's one of the two that is just active and mobile but she's just one that is active and mobile in other dimensions because one of the things that she can do as a moon dragon god or rather just a moon dragon but at her level is she can freely cross through dimensions uh, moon dragons seem to have an ability to where they can just open portals we don't know the range of it is i would imagine you know lower ones can open just portals in general and travel around the world but Celine, because of her placement in her just general existence level in terms of strength she is able to go to other universes and other dimensions at will which is interesting because she can go to edelis and she just fine there because she is a moon dragon 
So magic is in addition to her. So going to somewhere like Edelis is not really going to affect her considering though it would be like, oh, any magic that she has accumulated over the years and on top of her dragon abilities wouldn't matter because her portals and everything are off of her innate dragon abilities. So Celine and just how she goes about her day is mostly she'll just go to a different world. She'll just go to a different dimension, hang out, find somewhere that she likes and stay there until it doesn't suit her anymore whether that seems to be that like she leaves and everything is is swell and fine or she leaves it in ruin and devastation because you know events just kind of occurred she's similar to acnologi in that way to where acnologi would just show up on the battlefield and just fight both sides she just is a person that once she arrives you just kind of have to deal with her you just have to hope that she doesn't destroy her, but it also kind of like Beerus from Dragon Ball. And I think that's really cool. Uh, I really like when characters who have a high stature are able to swing their weight around and back it up. Because you always have those characters in shows who are just general douchebags and rude and mean, and you're just waiting for them to get humbled because it's like, you know, you'll have one of those guys who's just a jerk, and then like, they try to be a jerk to the main character, and it turns out these guys are fodder and they get trashed. But somebody like Celine, who's able just to go around and pretty much command everybody to just, just bend to her whim and bend to her wishes, and they can't really do anything about it, because if she wants, she can either just kill them, or she can also send you to a different dimension with no way of coming home. So Celine, in just general, is a fun character. She is a complete chaos embodiment. I think that the whole fox aspect is really good into that, because... She doesn't have any form of real allegiance. She likes humans, but she's ultimately for herself. And I've always liked that about her. Um, for her abilities, like I said, she is pretty much a pure moon dragon. She doesn't seem to branch out too much outside of moon energy and manipulations. And just doing things that are natural to her race. And I think that's one of the things that really differs between the other dragon gods and then the ones that are just naturally powerful is the other ones look for ways to make up that gap whereas the ones that are just all around just you know a, a, almost like an ascended version of their species don't have to worry about any of those things it's just yeah and i'll get to it and with Merc and celine they just seem to be powerful we don't really know exactly if dragons just get more powerful with age i know that's a general thing in like dungeons and dragons like a dragon despite what they do the older they are they will just innately become more powerful they're it, it's like an automatic thing every day they're going to be slightly more powerful and then there's just ways that they themselves can get more powerful so celine is celine is uh, with i would say right now if you compare all the dragon gods she's the best one but she's not the one with the highest potential and who where everybody is seeing where she's going to be at in the end. Because I, I think at the end, it would make sense for her to be at the second spot because of the first one. Now, it's, the first one is going to be hard to go over. So Ignea, the fire dragon god, um, hey, there's going to be some people that notice who he looks like. And I, I won't go too much into it, but Ignea is the most interesting one for a lot of reasons. Part of it is he is the one that actually has a personal plot tie to Natsu because Natsu wants to deal with him and Ignea wants to fight Natsu to the death. He wants nothing more than to have a absolute battle of flames with the main character and to eventually see who keeps standing. The problem is he says, well, you're not strong enough right now, so we need to get you strong enough. And that's just going to be a fun time to see any time that he's on screen and any time he has any forms of dialogue. Because whereas Selene is chaos incarnate on a good way, Igni is chaos incarnate on a bad way. He'll just apparently show up in places, to different kingdoms and countries, and start destroying the place. He's like Acnologia if Acnologia did the whole apocalypse bit to where he was depicted, but actually like that because once we actually get a little understanding of acnologia he doesn't just go around you know causing destruction and chaos just because he has goals and whatnot when it comes to the extermination of the dragon race and sometimes places just seem to get caught up in all that with ignia 
He just seems to want to sometimes. He just wants to flex and test himself and really see where his power reaches can, you know, see if he can surprise himself ever and be like, wow, I'm more powerful than I was before. Um, the difference, too, when I was talking about, like, the pure dragons who just seem to be naturally powerful, Ignea, at least from what I can tell, also trains. He seems to always be trying to push himself and to, to grow and cry, climb that strength ladder, which I think is the thing that's really going to differentiate him from the other dragons. And, you know, as another serious way to compare it to, if you look at uh, Frieza, Frieza's race just seems to be naturally very powerful. And then we find out, like, oh, was it that Frieza had never trained in his life? So, like, the Frieza that fought Goku in the Namek Saga was just off of his innate level like essentially the base of his base like what he was born with and just has automatically so once he actually started to train you know when he's able to close those massive gaps between the namek saga all the way up to areas and super though it's crazy it's like i can see where that makes sense so if you have somebody that is just in birth I'm very, I have this massive untapped well of potential that is already going to be really crazy when you compare it to pretty much any other being in the entire multiverse of this series. And then on top of that, he trains and actually like looks at it as, yeah, how can I push myself to, to climb to those heights? It makes sense why he's able to, to, to reach levels that are at this godlike state. And like I said, there are there are ties and reasons as to why Ignea is where he's at. And on top of that, it seems to be we're going to be finding out more because as it is right now in the manga, the arc for him is just about to start getting underway. So we're, we're, we don't even really know a lot of the details involving him in depth and like his full extent and capabilities. Um, the dragon gods are claimed to be on par with Acnologia. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that really fast because I think it makes sense in the terms of strength-wise for them to be on par with him, but not able to defeat him. Because the differences between them is though they are natural dragons, he is a dragon slayer dragon. He is an artificial dragon through the process of dragonfication, which has both a... It's a double-edged sword. Because when you look at it, regardless of how powerful a dragon slayer is as long as they're from generations one through four not about generation five they have a weakness to motion sickness because parts of their brain and their motor skills are not fully ever adapted seemingly to the you know to their human body so it's like you just have senses and stuff that are trying to exist at a level for a dragon but they're in such a small vessel that it just be, can get kind of overwhelmed and it messes with their entire motory senses and messes with their whole ability to conjure magic and maintain any of their abilities and whatnot but on top of that they have the whole fact that they have the ability to eat their attribute and that is something that pushes their strength and ceiling to newfound heights so whereas, say, you have somebody like Wendy, who the Wendy, obviously, like I said, motion sickness, weakness, she has the fact that any form of era-based attacks she can eat and then eventually was, you know, regain magic and stamina, but also once they break through a threshold, will achieve dragon force. And that's really important because say you have a character who in base is a five, but in dragon force, that's you know, just assuming they can activate their own, you know, dragon force at will, it's like bam, now I'm a ten. And, you know, they're not able to currently become an eleven, but by the way that dragon slayers and slayer wizards in general work, uh, they can through eating something that is more powerful than them, but something they, they can handle, will put them at, you know, maybe they become a fifteen or a twenty or a thirty or a fifty. It's their, their massive ceiling potential that their intake of powers is what makes them so dangerous. And Acnologia, obviously, is just a straight magic dragon that makes him incredibly dangerous. So if you take these two characters and put them, on, you know, fight each other and they're equal, it's not going to matter because one character might be able to push himself and become more powerful just off of, you know, heat of the moment. Well, one character literally has a way to continuously grow just by things around him 
Because, like, with the Ether Nano and the Arrow, when you think about it, Acnologia could just intake as much power around him continuously into his body, regain magic and stamina, and keep pushing him to become more powerful. It's almost like an infinitely rising, uh, you know, power-up gauge from a fighting game. Because we know where, obviously, where certain ceilings and thresholds are, but being able to eat the space between time, it seems like Acnologia really doesn't have a threshold. And that's the thing that makes him so scary in the long run is though even if these characters are equal to each other, one character can essentially become an infinitely rising number that is going to overtake the other ones. So Ignea, in my opinion, is the most interesting. He has a very, a very interesting design. I won't go too much into why he has this design. You know, some people are, you know, already know some people are going to go, huh, what does he look like? And then some people are going to just be like, I'm not too sure what you mean. But from a standpoint of just him in the story and how he is, because he is not, he's not seemingly very pro-human or anti-human. Um, I believe personally that he's okay with humans just by where, how he grew up and that he is a dragon that is more so interested in people's strength and capabilities so if you have somebody that's strong enough to be entertaining to him and give him enough of a little battle, because you're not going to be able to get a good fight probably most of the time for him just based off how powerful he is. But as long as you can earn his respect, that's where probably he's at. Whereas Natsu looks at things from an individual standpoint, not of like people who are human or a dragon. He looks at them in general. You probably have a similar thing with Ignea, but in terms of like proving yourself with strength. So let's say if you have a human that is, you know, he's able to, you know, get enough of an entertaining little battle out of, he might like them. And we know, as I mentioned, that Dogermag ended up having a friend, Bier, uh, almost Bierna's, Ignea is that friend. Ignea at one point will mention that he only has one person he'd really consider a friend, and that being Dogermag, who is another dragon, who he actually seems to like, which is, again, very interesting, because I don't think dragons really have too much when it comes to friendship. So a dragon taking on a idea of probably more human set is very interesting to me. And on top of that, we do know that he's planning some form of setup to hopefully enact a new age of dragons and, and go about that to what extent and to how he's going to do it. We don't know. I mean, I can I can mention that just because it's, it's not like there's any way I could give spoilers to something that I don't know too much uh, for yet. We only just have a brief idea. But... He, to me, holds the highest potential out of them. Because on top of it, as I said, that out of all the dragon gods, he uh, they've mentioned, like, oh, they're supposedly on par with Acnologia. He's the only one that apparently is claims to be stronger than Acnologia. And though right now I would still say Acnologia is stronger, I can see Ignea potentially surpassing him because unlike Acnologia, it seems Ignea is very active. Akinologi, once he seemed to just run out of dragons to kill, he just seemed like he just chilled and eventually, or uh, occasionally he would go out and cause a little bit of chaos and then he'd go back to kind of just chilling. Igni is constantly pushing himself and constantly trying to, to climb that ladder. So to me, I think it would make a lot of sense if though Akinologi has a higher threshold, that threshold is never fully achieved because he was never trying to push it to that extent. Where it's like if you if if Acnologia was equally as active and equally doing the same way to kind of climb in power, then I don't think Ignea would be able to surpass him. But to where Ignea, uh, you know, is is continuously going, you can say Acnologia just chose to kind of sit to where he's at and only gain power whenever he felt like it and to grow whenever he felt like it. Whereas Ignea, it seems to be more of his drive to continuously be going up and up and up and, you know, become a, a much larger flame of destruction that is just unmatched by anything and anyone within the world. So that's going to be it for the most part. As I've said, we I didn't want to give too much of it. I wanted just a brief little summary of, of the Dragon Gods. There's going to be some people that just want, feel like listening to this and, and just going as a nice little refresher and there's going to be some people that just decide to, you know, maybe get a little bit of a peek at what they're going to be getting in 100 Years Quest with the Dragon Gods. Uh, I mean, like, I didn't even talk about exactly, I guess, where they, they sit in the 100 Years Quest, but I'm sure you can figure it out if you haven't. You're an anime only. You just decided to watch this video all the way through. I mean, it's, it's not too crazy to, to try and piece things together. I'll leave it up to you to figure out where you think that these guys all lie. 
I think that's kind of interesting. It's like if you are an anime only, you just decide to listen to this video. And then you're just trying to formulate your own ideas of like, well, how do these guys all fit in the story and what do they do? Um, but anyway, other than that, comment below. Tell me your thoughts about them. Which Dragon God is your favorite? Um, I mean, for me, it's it's definitely between Igni and Slain. I mean, it's, I feel like that's probably going to be the most choices. Alderaan is right under that for me, just because I really liked Alderaan. His whole performance, his arc was great. And so, other than that, comment below, thumbs up the video, but from the like button, subscribe, and check out my other videos. But than that, I appreciate everybody's already subscribed, and thank you all for listening.